And uh, yeah, I thought to start <coughs> with the acknowledgements and acknowledgements out to these animals, the yam, because yeah, we start working with the antibodies that you can uh, recover from camelides because of specific characteristics of these antibodies in comparison to conventional antibodies. And uh, maybe, yeah, maybe better anyway. <clears throat> so I think that everybody working in the lab has worked also with antibodies monoclonal and polyclonal, so what we call <coughs> usually conventional antibodies that are for sure good reagents, but with some limitations. And this, for this reason, people thought that IgG, for instance, is too large, too bulky, and try to get uh, smaller fragments, like for instance, fabs at the beginning, and then something synthetic, like single chain uh, uh, domains. And as a derivation of uh, a single chain, also different way of, of polymerizing uh, single chains, so in triabody, tri diabody, tetrabodies, and so on. But all these uh, uh, fragments that have been for a while a sort of hope in, in, the, in this field, at the, at the end uh, resulted to uh, uh, fragile in one sense and too uh, prone to aggregation in another. So at the end, have been abandoned, yeah? So, I mean, the advancement in the technology uh, was blocked for a while until people, by chance, identified that uh, camel had a special class of <coughs> antibodies. These antibodies are quite specific in the sense that you see there is no CH1, so there is no possible of coupling or pairing of the light chain, so at the end you get a complete IgG that is missing the light chain and the CH1. So the whole information in this case is just concentrated in the, uh, in the single variable region that's called VHH. So one of the things that people uh, uh, thought already at the beginning is try to understand how these antibodies could work in the sense, how, or what was the meaning of having antibodies that had only one domain, but still uh, sufficient binding capacity um, towards the antigen? So if you consider a conventional antibody, the paratop of the antibody is given by the combination of the light and the heavy chain. Yeah? So you have six loops that contribute to the paratop. And all this uh, uh, surface is involved in the binding of the antigen. And because of this structure, as you can see here, usually uh, uh, the epitope recognized on the uh, antigen is flat or protruding, yeah? And the antibody itself makes a sort of bow. When you have a VHH, there is something completely different, yeah? So uh, you see that the CDR1 and CDR2 have uh, dimensions that are similar to the conventional antibodies, but we have a very long CDR3 that sometimes has an internal uh, disulfide bind to, bound to get more structure. By such a way, uh, you can preserve the, a large binding uh, capacity towards the antigen, but with a different philosophy. So if you see here, there is a protruding, very uh, protruding uh, domain that corresponding to the CDR3 that goes and, and finds some grooves or uh, pockets inside the uh, antigen. So somehow, uh, the way in which the VHH works is complementary to the conventional antibodies because for preserving a sufficient area of contact with the antigen, uh, they have very large CDR3 that recognize conformational epitopes usually in, uh, in the antigen. And as you can see here, so there are different examples. To compare the epitope recognized by VHH from llamas or from shark, like the AGNR, 
and conventional antibodies. As you can see, conventional antibodies recognize uh, antibodies in the surfaces. Uh, the antibodies from VHH recognize uh, cavities in the antigen. By such a way, it's possible to get antibodies that are uh, uh, competitive inhibitors, for instance, of active site of uh, enzymes. As you can see here in this example here, among all the different uh, uh, VHH, only one uh, recognize, only this one recognize <laughs> Uh, a surface on the external part of the antigen, all, all, all the other recognize the uh, uh, active site of the enzyme. And the same thing has been identified also for alpha amylase, not only this uh, lysozyme. Oh, okay, so at this point, it can be useful to have uh, antibodies of, of these classes because they recognize different uh, epitopes and with a different strategy. And uh, when you think to, to recover your antibodies, you can go through conventional way, like for monoclonal and polyclonal, so immunizing an animal, so you have to pass through an animal. Or, or you can think to uh, uh, recover large uh, immune library that can be either immunized or not immune. Yeah? And when you work or you opt for a non-immune library, you have still two uh, possibilities. Start from animal material, or you can opt for a completely synthetic way. And you get collection of exactly uh, naive or synthetic uh, library, for instance, in the HH uh, uh, domain. Uh, but then it's okay. So when you think or you wish for, uh, because you think that uh, only somatic maturation can give you antibodies of a specific quality. You have, so you wish to uh, pass through the animals and immunization. At that point, you can always find technical problems in order to get your antibodies. So first of all, to get enough antigen this can be a problem, especially for the you know, membrane protein and so on. Uh, yeah, maybe that the antigen is not available or uh, is not or is still unknown in some cases. Uh, the immunization uh, takes quite a long time, so you, you need to wait for uh, for all the procedure. In some cases, uh, the antigen you you wish to to use for immunization is not immunogenic because of structure conservation, for instance, and you have no control concerning the immune response of the animal. So it means that you cannot really uh, force the animal to give the antibodies you wish. Yeah. So, so we'll see some examples later on in terms of what epitopes can be uh, relevant for you to have for your, for your research. So antibodies for sure are uh, something that uh, are preferable to other kind of molecules when you have to recognize something and you know some characteristic of antibodies that can be useful for uh, uh, designing a, a, a structure that is optimal for your aims. So for instance, when you consider a VH region you have uh, four frameworks that are conserved. You can see here the variability of the residues at the uh, different frameworks. Yeah, so it's really very low. And then you have the three loops, the CDRs, that are hypermutated even I mean, in nature. And so if you think to make your own library synthetic, you can uh, consider a strategy that uh, sort of mirrors what happens in vivo. So we have a framework that is uh, stable and hypermutate the CDRs. And it's what we have done in Paris. So by such a way, we use the fixed frameworks, try to analyze a little bit what is possible 
in order to reduce the you know, um, uh, immunological response in, in, in human in case. And then if I permutated the CDR1, uh, 2, and 3, and the CDR3 is also of four different uh, uh, length in order to correspond to what happens in vivo. Uh, well, we don't cover completely the diversity you have in vivo, in which you can have also uh, CDR3 of uh, 24 amino acids. Ours have 9, 12, 15, or 18 amino acids. And the library we prepared has a diversity of 3 to the 10 to the 9, or 3 billions of uh, antibodies. And uh, this is the theoretical diversity, but we did also deep sequencing. And uh, for what we have checked, there is really a complete uh, corresponding to the theoretical model. After some test panning, we uh, uh, found that the library was efficient in, in, uh, in getting or in selecting antibodies for uh, known um, antigens. And then we uh, tried to produce these antibodies and validate the activity. And at this point, we knew that we had a functional library we could use for, for our experiments. So uh, I calculated a little bit how much cost a panning, so uh, a panning cycle, so how much does it cost to get at the end your antibodies in comparison to the price you can have if you do by yourself a, a monoclonal antibodies? And we are in yeah, some hundreds of, of euros, so something that is roughly one fifteenth of, of the, uh, the cost we had for producing a monoclonal. Uh, you can have it in two weeks, so it's extremely faster than, than monoclonal. Uh, there is no uh, problem with toxicity of immunogenicity because the selection is in vitro. You can also select antibodies for unknown epitopes, but epitopes that any may, anyway make sense because are able to discriminate between, for instance, uh, cell classes. You don't pass through animals, and uh, this can be also an advantage, especially if you have restriction or uh, legislation that uh, impairs this application. And you can have affinity uh, of variable level. This is also quite important. Um, for, for several years, I think that uh, uh, affinity has been sold, especially from companies, as uh, a plus. But uh, more and more of the data, in vivo data, demonstrate that uh, too high affinity in vivo can be uh, uh, a problem because uh, what happens is that uh, if you have antibodies that are too affine, they are just blocked on the surface, for instance, of a solid tumor, they are not able to penetrate. So you need intermediate affinity, so enough to bind to the target but also to be re uh, released and, and then, in case, move a little bit inward and, and bind again and again. So by such a way, for instance, uh, f systematic um, experiments show that uh, uh, in vivo affinity around uh, 10 nanomolar are more efficient than uh, affinities uh, in the range of, of uh, picomolars. Yeah. Then, for sure, it depends of, of the application. And uh, it's something that is also related to the dimension and the uh, valency of, of your antibody. These are also other aspects. I will not talk uh, um, in detail of these in this talk. But if you wish, we can discuss uh, all these later on during the, the final discussion. So once you have a library, it's a phage library. So it's a usual way in which uh, you pan a phage library with the only advantage, quite significant, that uh, the cloning of the library is just done in, in, in once because you have one single domain to, to put in. So there is uh, your sequence, a tag, and then the, the phage uh, protein peer free that allows you to, to get your antibodies X exposed on the phage. So as phage works, you have the possibility to connect the phenotype 
to the genotype that is uh, inside the, the phages. So you can recover through several panning cycles your specific antibody. So you clone all the diversity of, of your sequences in, in the antibodies. Okay, in this case, it's just the example of a single chain, but uh, VHH is the same. Uh, you bind, you wash what is uh, unspecific, you amplify it uh, for a couple of times, and, and then you get your specific antibodies. This is true for uh, uh, soluble antigens. You can, uh, you can stick on, on surfaces or on beads. But what we uh, did, especially in the last years, was panning on cells. Yeah? And, and this is because uh, among the antigens, uh, membrane proteins are for sure the, the, the most tricky and most difficult to produce. So if you can directly select antibodies on the cells, it's a, a great advantage. You don't need to, to spend time for producing the, uh, the antigen. And you do your panning on something, uh, I mean, on structure that are the native structure with all the post-translational modification and are embedded exactly in the natural uh, uh, lipid bilayer that, uh, that the antibodies in case will find in the final application in vivo. So you are selecting antibodies that are uh, structurally extremely closer to rec or are thought to recognize extremely closer than antibodies that recognize uh, recombinant protein, uh, their antigen in in vivo condition, even in the panning as is done in, in, uh, in vitro. So what happens in this case? You take all your library, you challenge the, your library together with the uh, uh, control cells. So control cells is quite uh, 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 unprecise concept, but it means that uh, uh, you can use any kind of cells that uh, make sense to, uh, to consider a sort of, of negative control of what you are looking for. So can be, for instance, uh, 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 healthy cells in comparison to something that is mutated towards a uh, disease uh, cells, can be a stage of a disease in comparison to another one, can be uh, a subpopulation compared to another. So it is up to you to understand what is maybe your best system of control. Anyway, you deplete your library against uh, this first cell uh, population. It means that if, you, if there are uh, antibodies displayed by phages that binds to these cells, it, there are antibodies that rec recognize common epitopes or epitopes you are not interested in. So you discharge all this material here and the unbound fraction you keep and you go on your target cells, yeah? And uh, even in this case, you'll have two subpopulations, something that doesn't bound and something that binds. And what is bound here is something that is specific for these cells and is not specific for this because it didn't bind the first time. So you're sure that you selected some antibodies that can discriminate between these two kind of cells. And uh, so, Using this uh, approach, you can do different kind of, of uh, uh, selection. So for instance, you can uh, select antibodies against known biomarkers and find antibodies for new biomarkers that specifically expressed on, on some uh, cell subpopulation. Yeah? So exactly, we work uh, mainly with uh, cancer cells, but this can be applied to any kind of, of uh, disease or system even. And uh, since the screening is done at proteomic level, it takes uh, in account also all the translational modification. So some examples, two examples. <coughs> in one case, is <coughs> we uh, used uh, two cell lines. One it is almost negative for uh, HER2 expression, another is positive. And the other case is just one cell line, the same, wild type are overexpressing a specific uh, target. In this case, it's FS to share. So in the first case, 
we have something like this. So uh, um, uh, the target was uh, CD36. And uh, here is the CD36 uh, uh, fused the GFP, and this is the distribution of the antigen. And this is this, the picture identified using the VHH selected against uh, uh, these, uh, I mean, cells overexpressing this antigen. And you can see they merge very well. And this is the control, a negative control. You see it doesn't work in this case, so fine. And in the case of uh, uh, the FSH receptor, <coughs> Um, we did the panning, and then we used the phages directly for uh, the screening. Using the phages has uh, two advantages. Well, it, it, it's easy to, to get them directly from, from your uh, uh, bacteria and uh, supernatin. And uh, the fact that uh, the uh, epitope recognized by the antibody is repeated on the surface makes that uh, the signal is very clear. Yeah? So you get, uh, you can see here, uh, 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 between negative and positive, the signal is, is, is very clear. You have something that is in between, and you think, OK, maybe it's good or not. And um, when you repeat uh, the, the, the fax analysis using the VHH, so just the uh, antibody and not the rest of the, uh, of the phages, and you use the tag appended to the antibody. You can confirm the data. So this is the negative cell line, this is the positive. So you can see that you, rec you get different antibodies with different binding capacity. And uh, since this receptor is a GPCR receptor, <coughs> you can use the accumulation of CMP to understand if uh, your antibody has also an inhibitory effect or not. And uh, so this is a control VHH, and anti-GFP has no uh, uh, inhibitory effect. You see the control here. Here, this uh, inhibitory effect of the monoclonal that uh, it's, it has been described for uh, inhibiting the activity of a receptor. And here is the uh, results with our VHH. So all of them have inhibitory effects. And this is the, the first time, indeed, that uh, somebody were able to use a pre-immune library to identify uh, inhibitors of a GPCR protein panning directly on, on cells. And here's uh, our classic, uh, I mean, our uh, model. So um, we do the panning uh, depleting on the R2 negative cell lines, MCF10A, and then enrich on the SKBR3. Uh, and uh, this is the result out of one plate we analyzed by fax. So we got 58 positive among 88. So it's, you see already after uh, this was free uh, cycle of panning, you get the majority of, of the clones you have are positive. Still, you uh, preserve a pretty good um, variability, so 15 unique sequences. And of these, 13 were for R2, but we know that it's extremely highly expressed on this uh, cell line, so we expected to get antibodies that can R2. But still, there are two sequences that recognize something else, I mean, some unknown biomarker specific of these cell lines that is not expressed in this one. Yeah? And uh, for instance, these antibodies work pretty well in uh, uh, immunoprecipitation. This is a quite typical pattern of HER2 because there is a full length protein and all the shedding products. And we'll see something else about uh, these uh, binders. But I uh, wish first of all, <coughs> to understand a more general view how uh, this technique of panning can be improved in order to get antibodies uh, that are uh, specific for some function that can be relevant for our studies. Yeah? For instance, in the case of receptor, I can have, for instance, a uh, receptor, uh, uh, a receptor, uh, sorry, a receptor with recognized by two antibodies that, for instance, 
there is uh, one specific for ligand inhibition and second for the dimerization inhibition. And I wish to get a couple of uh, recombinant antibodies that have the same characteristics of these uh, two, uh, uh, for instance, therapeutic antibodies already available. So this is the ligand, it binds to the receptor, there is a dimerization. And uh, so what I need is uh, two antibodies, one blocking the ligand and one blocking the dimerization. Yeah? And maybe I can have also other antibodies here that can be useful for uh, imaging or uh, for, uh, yeah, for having the possibility to, to control the presence of my uh, receptor uh, without uh, impairing the ligand or the binding or the dimerization of the receptor. And uh, by such a way, if I use during elution a competition with the ligand, I can remove among all the antibodies that recognize my receptor just the subclass of antibodies that compete with the ligand for the same epitope. And uh, <clears throat> if I obtain dimerization, I can also get a second class of antibodies that are exactly the antibodies that compete for, uh, for the dimerization site. And then I can use triethylamine for remove the, the, the uh, sorry the remaining antibodies that binds to uh, epitopes not involved in a specific recognition. So at the end, I have uh, a, a different classes of antibodies with different functionality that can help me in uh, uh, organizing different strategy to study this receptor. And I can also, uh, in case of, I don't know, uh, one specific antibody, use, again, competition to uh, select different uh, antibodies for the same epitope with uh, specificity, I don't know, of uh, affinity or, or uh, roughly different uh, epitope recognition. Uh, okay. This is uh, an example. <coughs> of this strategy we used. So in this case, uh, we did the first uh, panning uh, against uh, FGF receptor one. And what we found were, were, uh, was a, a really a great amount of antibodies, but all against the same epitope. And this was not a functional epitope. So these antibodies were nice for imaging and so on, but were not useful for, uh, yeah, for, uh, for instance, for inhibiting the activation of a receptor. So what we did later on was a panning, exactly as the first one, but instead of uh, doing uh, the elution with uh, triethylamine, this is a classical way of removing any binder, we anticipate uh, a step by, uh, and we did a competition uh, with the natural ligand FGF2. Uh, and by such a way, if this is the epitope that was recognized by the standard uh, T uh, uh, eluted antibodies, we recognized two classes of antibodies, one that were overlapping between FGF and, uh, and uh, the, the other the standard, class, uh, standard cluster of antibodies, and the second one that was only specific for uh, the epitope recognized by the natural ligand. Yeah? And we use this uh, antibody to show that uh, it was really functional somehow, yeah? And, uh, and this is the experiment. So if you take the, the cells, yeah, you can um, identify on the surface the uh, receptor, and after 24 hours, they're still on the surface. It doesn't change anything. If you add the ligand, the presence of heparin, after 24 hours, instead of having this distribution on the, on the surface, the <coughs> receptors has been completely internalized, yeah? But if you put the a competitor antibody together with the, uh, the natural ligand and the heparin, you are able to block 
the, uh, the function induced by the ligand. So, and uh, the receptor is still present completely on the surface. So even if this uh, antibody here was really weak in terms of affinity, uh, uh, the fact that uh, it has a binding capacity that is competitive uh, uh, towards the natural ligand uh, allows to use it as uh, a reagent to block so to tune the activity of the receptor. And uh, so when we have the case we have seen before, we have uh, at this point uh, uh, different antibodies for different uh, epitopes that we know, at least partially. Then we can reconstitute uh, molecules in which uh, uh, antibodies blocking different functional sites are uh, are put together, and we can use even a third one in order to improve, for instance, the avidity of, of our molecule. And there are different uh, tags we can use, uh, con uh, molecules we can use to e change the, uh, the um, uh, avidity of our systems, for instance, an FC domain for every bivalent, uh, a coil coil system for a trivalent, uh, system based on streptavidin. And for sure, we can also, uh, we have, I mean, it's more tricky but feasible also to have uh, B specific or tri specific antibodies based on this system here. Okay, <clears throat> so this was the classical way, and this is a specific application. So, a collaborator of ours had the problem to find a antibody that were able to recognize both the mouse and human isoform of, uh, of an antigen. So, in this case, ALK. So, <laughs> what we did is the first step of depletion against uh, hex cells of well, type. And so we removed all the uh, antibodies that recognize specifically this class of, I mean, yeah, this uh, cell line. And then we do the enrichment on the uh, egg cells, but overexpressing ALK, uh, murine ALK. And we selected some antibodies. And then we use the same selected antibodies uh, to enrich against the HEC. Uh, cell line that uh, overexpressed the uh, human ALK. And so by such a way, in a single um, uh, panning sequence, we were able to identify antibodies that were specifically recognizing the two uh, isoform. And this was not possible, for instance, when people try to identify antibody, conventional antibodies in hybridoma uh, cell lines using uh, conventional uh, Techniques. So this was just a work of a couple of weeks instead of, of screening for months hybridomas. And this is the result. So you see that uh, uh, so there's a, a control against the, the, uh, our anti antibody has it worked. So they recognize both uh, isoform. And uh, this antibody we used was used also for selecting by, by uh, facts a, a, yeah, a new cell line with the characteristic of ALK positive from, from human uh, material. So. Then one advantage uh, uh, we have of working together with the hospital in, in uh, Curie is that uh, they have a large collection, I mean, there is a, a lab that is uh, uh, devoted to translational uh, <coughs> uh, research, and they prepare, uh, in the years, they prepared a large collection of PDX, so passion derived xenografts. And uh, these are tumors uh, of human origin that have been <coughs> uh, xenografted in, uh, into mice and that can be reproduced uh, uh, on mice. So what, what it means is that you can have the possibility to come back to the original tumor at any time because you have the original human tumor just uh, uh, propagated in, in mouse. 
and the characteristic of this tumor remains very, very close to the human uh, original one, with the exception of 5% of stromal uh, cells that are uh, murine. But all the rest, I mean, are the, the original cells. So the structure is the structure of a tumor. It's not just the proliferation of cells. It's the structure of the tumor and the poly polyclonality is the polyclonality of the tumor. So it's a very nice model. Also because when you to do, we have to do a test in, in vivo, well, you work with something that is still a, a true tumor and not just a dispersion of uh, amorphous dispersion of cells that is growing in, in, the, in the mouse. So, Probably we expect there are not uh, we are not at the point, but we expect that uh, the in vivo um, experiments performed with PDX will resemble more to the human uh, clinical uh, experiments. Uh, I don't know in phase uh, two and three, with respect to uh, experiments you can do with uh, normal xenograft. And we use this PDX also for doing our selection. So in this case, we used uh, uh, PDX from uval melanoma because Curie is the reference center, I think, in Europe for this kind of well, pretty rare but still important uh, uh, tumor of, of, of eye. So we used uh, <coughs> a, a depletion against the RP1 and uh, positive selection against uh, uh, cells prepared freshly I mean, uh, from PDX uh, recovered from a mouse. And uh, we got 88 positive 96 tested. And we tested them <coughs> on uh, the cell line originated from the same PDX and from the PDX itself. Yeah, so, I mean, maybe it's not so clear. I mean, when you have a PDX, you can use directly the fresh cells from the PDX itself, or you can, I mean, the people from, from this lab, they originated also some cell lines from this, uh, from this uh, tumor. We were interested to see if the cell lines had different characteristics to, uh, in comparison to the PDX because we expected that the fact of, of culturing cells will change something. And it's true, it's exactly what happened. So if you see here, yeah, so this is the control. So the control, you see, it's really always negative. And here we have the, the PDX and uh, the, the cell lines originated from this. And you see that sometimes we have a condition like this in which we have the cell lines that have high sig or higher signal with respect to the original uh, PDX and sometimes the opposite. So it means that at least some of these 44 different uh, uh, antibodies recognize antigen that switched during a cell culture and, uh, and yeah, disappear, for instance, in, 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 the, in the cell lines, like here, probably, or are overexpressed in the cell lines with respect to the original tumor. And um, when you use these antibodies, you can try to use different cell lines to understand if you recognize pattern of recognition, and by such a way, identify groups of antibodies that probably recognize uh, the same uh, antigen. And you can get antibodies that are specifically anti uval melanoma, uh, other that recognize also different melanocyte uh, cell lines, and other that are quite uh, unspecific, so recognize different uh, tumor lines or even control cells and so on. And even in the case of um, you, uveal melanoma, there is strong difference <coughs> among uveal melanoma of different uh, genetic background. So by such a way, you can classify uh, antibodies, identify antibodies from different classes, and, uh, uh, and then you can start uh, the process of identification by immunoprecipitation spec. And here, okay, I can show you the, the name of the target we got, but we identified so far two um, antigens that have been 
uh, immunoprecipitated by, by our antibodies. And then we tried to get something more specific. So we thought, OK, now we work with a, a primary tumor. Maybe we can get uh, the same and try to see if we find antibodies specific for metastatic uh, tumor. So we used the same uh, genetic background, but uh, metastatic. Same uh, procedure, so depletion against RP1 cell line. And, uh, and then uh, the screening. So we identify 45 unique sequences. So they're negative in fax, positive in fax. And uh, the surprise was that uh, all the 45 sequences, they were positive for the first uh, antigen we identified before. Yeah? So uh, in the metastatic, somehow, this antigen is even overexpressed or more overexpressed than in the primary tumor. So it means that when you do the panning, you find a lot of, they are all different sequences, but are all recognizing the same antigen. But you can use also a different strategy of panning. So in such a way, we deplete on the primary tumor and enrich on the metastatic tumor. And by such a way, we are uh, we're able to identify, OK, some uh, antibodies recognize both, but five sequences are recognized, so more specifically tumor, uh, par, uh, sorry, uh, metastatic uh, uh, tumors and not primary tumors, yeah? And by such a way, the interesting thing is that uh, all the antibodies we uh, identified by such a, a strategy are not recognizing the overexpressed antigen that is usually so largely expressed that uh, make the, this large conver con well, this converging yeah, uh, selection against it. So, I think it's quite interesting to, to see that even if in one cell population we have, you have an antigen that is extremely more expressed than any other else, or at least we can say in, in vitro immunogenic extremely more than any other else, if you identify the correct panning strategy, you can harness your system in order to get anyway antibodies for rare antigen, yeah? And here, okay, again, we, we try to identify different patterns. So you see here, these are clearly probably recognizing the same, uh, uh, the same antigen, and these and these are also very similar, and this is probably a different one. So now we are trying to identify what are these meta metastasis-specific antibodies. Yeah? And here is another example. Show, so we used different cell lines, yeah? different antibodies, and the level of expression, uh, level of expression, I mean, the activity as measured by fax. No, sorry, this is by, by ELISA, sorry. And uh, to show that uh, uh, looking and the, uh, at the pattern of expression on the different cells, you should identify the antibodies that recognize different antigens. What was some nice to recognize that the control cell lines were always negative, like certain here, yeah? So, and uh, uh, tumor cell lines were positive, maybe in some cases and not in others and so on, because this is exactly the, the different uh, level of, of expression of, uh, of the antigens. And um, so <clears throat> using this strategy, um, uh, corresponding to seven different panning on two models. We, we screened 500 uh, clones, uh, and then we sequenced 450. We identified 110 unique sequences uh, used for, uh, uh, for identifying 35 antibodies to, to use for uh, uh, IP, and uh, by but uh, so far, we identified, uh, okay, now it's six targets, and we are uh, in the mass spec for other four or five of them. So, uh, and what, what we found at the end is that <clears throat> when you use this strategy, 
I mean, it's very effective to identify antibodies that discriminate between different epitopes, but to identify new biomarkers maybe it's not the, the best way because you have a bias yeah, against uh, some classes of antibodies with specific characteristics. So usually are large uh, antigen with specific characteristics. So it means that they are large uh, with strong glycosylation and uh, are known to be expressed on, on uh, tumor cells. Usually they belong to the IgG superfamily. So uh, you can think that uh, it are anti uh, antigen like this and when you think to a cells, I mean, there is something probably like this. So they form a sort of forest, yeah, a canopy around the cells. And so if you have something smaller uh, inside, maybe it's not accessible by phages, especially because phages are quite bulky. So it can be a problem to identify um, good markers that are uh, small or, uh, yeah, not not so easily accessible as the first layer uh, canopy uh, antigens. And once you have your antibodies, then uh, you, you can try to produce them and use them. Yeah? So the, the first advantage of using uh, uh, recombinant antibodies and VHH uh, even more than a single chain is they're clonable. Yeah? Uh, consider just the fact that you wish to functionalize your antibodies, the conventional antibodies, and uh, yeah, if you use uh, lysines to to activate your uh, your antibody, to label your antibody, lysines can be random uh, present on your surface. It means that. Uh, uh, if this is a paratop and you are lucky, maybe uh, the uh, labeling is done on lysines that are outside from the, from the paratop. And in the worst case, uh, the labeling uh, impairs the activity of your antibodies because it changed the, uh, the surface of your paratop. But even in this case here, you cannot control really very well the level of expression you could have. Uh, in one case, it's this pattern. In other cases, you know, just here, a labeling and so on. So you get the population of antibodies with different kind of, of labeling. Uh, I've seen once one paper in which people uh, analyzed after labeling what happened of, your, of <coughs> their uh, antibody. And they found more than 10,000 different classes starting from one single antibody. So even if you don't impair the activity, all the other, I mean, in vivo uh, 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 characteristics can be changed. So you have a very uh, uh, heterogeneous material. But if you have a recombinant antibody, it doesn't matter where you have your, your lysine because you can have, well, you know, pretty well here, you can add a tag in a direction and, and then you get your functionalization as specific um, um, residue there. So we work on different uh, tags to, to check what could be more useful and so on. So SNAP tag, for instance, is a nice system for cell biology because you can get covalently bound of any derivative of benzene guanine. And there are a lot of these molecules available on the market. The same, you can use orthogonal uh, chemistry, uh, clip and halo, uh, that is so the similar criteria, even if the chemistry is different. And then you can directly produce a fusion protein, uh, your antibody, the toxin, alkaline phosphatase, uh, a sequence for biotinylation. We use also the sequence for sortases. But n now probably the, the most popular in our lab are, okay, the FC to reconstitute the, the antibody and having also the possibility to purify by protein A or using uh, anyway the FC as a direct tag. The direct fusion to GFP, uh, free cysteines because it's for malamide uh, chemistry. And this uh, C-term tag, it's a, a very efficient tag. It is, uh, indeed is an affinity tag uh, this is to show <coughs> how it works uh, in facts when you use uh, um, uh, the, 
this tag here. This is just to show the, the direct fusion of the GFP. But the, what I, I wish to show you is that the C tag allowed a very, very clean purification. So this is a, a purification of the same uh, antibody with a talon and with the C tag. And uh, so the difference is really very, very sharp. And in the, for immune purification, we found that this C tag is really very handy. Okay, so once you have your uh, uh, domain, yeah, you can reconstitute it in uh, IgG. You can add different uh, uh, tags or protein that can change the uh, dimension of so the mass of your antibodies is important, especially in vi in vivo, to uh, modulate the the half life in vivo. And you can also uh, produce bivalent and bispecific antibodies. Uh, the effect of, of work in direct cells allow to uh, identify antibodies that recognize native epitopes and they're also uh, easily uh, accessible on the cell surface. So for in vivo application, it is an advantage. So you can really, uh, you, you think that if you pan on, on cells and you have antibodies that can will be useful for in vivo application. Yeah? And the fact of having a premium library uh, simplifies things. So we did also some experiments in vivo with, uh, with a set of antibodies, I mean, a set of antibodies in the sense that it's just the same antibodies all the time. So it's uh, an anti-R2. Uh, but we, uh, we use it in, in different formats. And the formats uh, change in terms of mass and in terms of uh, valency. Yeah? So we have bivalent, uh, monovalent and bivalent. Yeah? Trastuzumab is the control, uh, uh, conventional monoclonal antibodies. And we have a negative uh, control that is an anti-GFP anti antibody. And then we have a bivalent, 30 kilodalton, monovalent, 15. Uh, the FC are constituted and the one of the SNAP, okay. And uh, so 60 kilodalton is the cutoff for the kidney uh, uh, filtration. So you are expected that something larger than 50 kilodalton, like the bivalent uh, reconstituting we have C and the trastuzumab takes a uh, long time of circulation. And uh, the other, in contrast, they have a half time of 15 minutes yeah, in, in, in vivo. So it's a very fast reaction. So <clears throat> we checked at three hours, at 48 hours, what happens with the different antibodies. And as you can see here, so it's something that uh, luckily corresponds to what you expected in, uh, theoretically. So trastuzumab and, the, um, and the, the bivalent and the FC, they accumulate, they start accumulating, but not very strongly, yeah? This is a negative control. And the CA2 with the SNAP is, is also a negative control in the sense that uh, um, the chromophore we added, uh, it, was not uh, detected by the by the equipment, so we checked the infrared yeah, um, uh, signal. In contrast, the very small antibodies of the monovalent uh, accumulated already mostly after uh, three hours, yeah. and the large antibodies, trastuzumab, as a control negative, uh, positive, and the IgG like uh, C8 accumulate after 38 hours. And uh, as you can see, the negative remain negative, and this that was starting having some efficiency here, it's uh, cleared after 48 hours. And as you can see here, also in vivo, you start seeing the, uh, the signal after 38 hours on the tumor, the subcutaneous tumor in, in animals. Okay, the other advantage of using recombinant antibodies is that you are quite flexible for the expression. And in the past, we used the classical way of expressing the periplasm, but we try also different ways. So the expression on the surface will, I don't tell you anything about this, but it can be useful for some application and the uh, expression, the cytoplasm. 
especially in the cytoplasm, has the advantage of giving the possibility to produce extremely larger amount of your antibody. And, uh, and so it's, it's cheaper at the end, for, uh, especially if you need uh, to get uh, starting material for, uh, for your assay. So what we do is express our antibodies in an uh, oxidizing system uh, based on the sulfid rich oxidase uh, in, in bacteria. And uh, here are compared in, in um, facts the uh, activity and yeah, the efficiency of our antibodies expressed in the periplasm, the cytoplasm, and this is the control. So it's exactly the same. Um, vector just uh, with or without uh, uh, leader peptides so it accumulate either in the periplasm in the cytoplasm you see that uh, it seems even better the cytoplasmic antibody okay this is maybe it's uh, and uh, and when you when we express the igg like antibodies they have activity similar to the transduzumab so and uh, and also here you see in the if they work very well. I mean, they have very specific staining. And uh, for people more coming from protein production. So the SNAP tag, <clears throat> you see this is a gel filtration of the, uh, of the anti purified antibodies from the cytoplasm. There is still some aggregation, at least in, in this case, less here and so on. This is the, the distribution. So there is not so much I don't know, degradation or uh, 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 ag strong aggregation at least. And regarding FC tag, okay, it's very clean in the gel and also I mean the, um, the gel filtration indicated is something almost perfectly monomeric and also quite nice, uh, the distribution pattern. <coughs> So sometimes people say that, okay, you use uh, monoclonal antibodies, maybe you have not enough affinity, or how can you uh, change things and so on. We try to do some, uh, uh, some work, the proton, uh, so, uh, well, proton is a sort of biocore, but it's a multi-system. Multi so it allows to, to, to get uh, all the data at once because you have, uh, uh, 36 uh, spots, so you can get all the information to get the complete uh, uh, um, uh, analysis in, in once, so it's quite reproducible what you get. And uh, we try to see uh, for sure the, the true affinity uh, using monovalent uh, uh, antibodies, but also uh, what you, how, how much you can uh, gain if you reconstitute your antibodies in, in bivalent systems. Yeah? And uh, so usually, okay, you gain at least one log when you pass from monovalent uh, to bivalent uh, system. This is quite expected. You still remain a little bit uh, lower in affinity with respect to transduzuma. What we notice that, uh, is that the tag you attach to, to, to append to, to your antibodies make a difference in terms of affinity, probably because the access especially of these small molecules that are VHH to the antigen is can be impaired by a large tag. So for instance, uh, this is a tag that is quite floppy and we have uh, yeah, 12 uh, nanomolar affinity for the same antibody uh, that here with this very short tag, uh, it's uh, two nanomolar. So you can get even one log of difference just because of uh, optimization of tag. But still, you have quite good affinity for uh, at least in, in, in vivo application. <clears throat> this is something that uh, I extrapolated from a publication. People said, OK, um, what is the, the meaning of having antibodies with different uh, affinities? That sometimes you can have uh, troubles due to the fact that uh, the specificity uh, can change the effect of your uh, activity in vivo. Yeah? And this is because of two reasons. One is the fact that your antibodies can be titrated in, a, in the plasma by shedding products yeah, or secreted proteins. And, so on. 
And the second is that uh, uh, you can have uh, off-target binding because some antigens are anyway expressed also on other tissues. That is probably true for any antigen. So if you have something that is very strong binding, uh, you can get uh, binding uh, to, to negative cells, yeah? Because, uh, uh, exactly because it, it recognizes anyway the target. In some cases, uh, uh, maybe this is not sufficient for, uh, for binding, and you can get binding only if you have a bispecific and bivalent uh, system in which uh, the presence of two different uh, antigens give you the possibilities of binding. Yeah? So if, for instance, the affinity of 20 uh, uh, oh, sorry, millimolar is not sufficient to bind directly to the single antibody, if you get through avidity an improvement of affinity and you find only in your target cells the sufficient density of both uh, antigen, only in this case your antibody will be able to bind to, to your target. <clears throat> oh, this is just maybe quite quickly to show that uh, once you have your antibody, we try to, to see uh, if it could be used also for different applications. So we work with people that uh, make uh, nanoparticles. So in this case, uh, the antibodies are quite easily uh, uh, functionalized on the surface of the nanoparticles to give the possibility to nanoparticles to recognize specifically their cells. And the nanoparticles are sort of multivalent system that can cluster the, the receptor, internalize them. Um, you can use uh, this, I mean, recombinant antibodies because they have a specific uh, um, uh, or orienting possibility through the tag to orient them on, on the sensors. So we are studying different way of working, for instance, the biotin streptavidin in which you can orient through uh, this uh, binding using a uh, single uh, strand uh, DNA that can match with a, a corresponding DNA and uh, exactly the snap tag with its uh, <coughs> a surface. And uh, by such a way, there is a collaborator of us that now try to see if the system can be detected by atomic force microscopy and other that use uh, uh, classical way of detection or electrochemical uh, system based on, on the presence of enzymes or uh, the possibility to, to use a mixed system of uh, uh, PCR and, 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 uh, and affinity. And uh, this is just to, to acknowledge all the people that uh, in the present, the past, and the future <laughs> will contribute to the work. So the people of our lab, I mean, and uh, the collaborators at uh, Curie and uh, in, in other universities that worked in, in the past with us. So thank you for your attention. <clears throat>